Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, what a great day this has been, and an honor it is to hear moderate the last panel on Indo-Pacific strategy. And I'm joined by three great professionals who are in the trenches working on trying to fill out a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, um, looking at the defense and diplomacy and working at the United Nations. Um, and so without further ado, I want to just open up with uh, Alex Wong, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, most recently out at Singapore at the summit and uh, working with the Secretary. Um, what is the State Department doing to implement the national security strategy that was issued last year calling for an Indo-Pacific strategy, sort of the Trump administration's version of what the Obama administration referred to as the pivot or the rebalance. <clears throat> and then I want to turn to Dave Helvey, maybe get a Defense Department perspective on that. Well, sure. Thanks, Patrick. It's, it's an honor to be here, an honor to be here at, at, at CNAS's uh, conference. Uh, first of all, I should say it's not just the State Department. It really is a whole of government USG effort to implement the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy and, and fulfill the uh, the, the mandates of the national security strategy, which identifies the Indo-Pacific as a region of rising competition, but rising strategic importance uh, and immense strategic importance for the, for the United States. And I should say what the administration has been doing uh, on the Indo-Pacific strategy didn't begin just recently. It didn't begin with the national security strategy. It really began even before President Trump took office. Uh, he, his first meeting he took as a president-elect was with uh, Prime Minister Abe of Japan. Then the first year, the Trump administration continued with a number of high-level uh, meetings with President Xi and other regional leaders, with long trips to the region by cabinet secretaries, including Secretary Mattis and Secretary Tillerson, uh, an extremely long trip by the vice president to the region, and then we capped the year with the longest presidential trip to the Indo-Pacific in a generation, where President Trump gave a speech in Da Nang, Vietnam, where he introduced the strategic concept of the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. So this first year, the first year of the Trump administration was really to reaffirm the US commitment to the region, to acknowledge uh, that we are an Indo-Pacific nation, we have long been an Indo-Pacific nation, we will continue to be an Indo-Pacific nation. And now that we look at the second, third, and fourth years of at least the first term of the Trump administration, we're looking at formulating and implementing uh, the policies and the programs that will, will, will actuate and, and put meat on the bones of that strategy. Now, we're not starting from a standing stop, though. I mean, everyone in this room acknowledges and knows how engaged the United States is in the Indo-Pacific. We have an alliance structure, uh, an alliance system that's unmatched, not just currently, but in history uh, in the region. We have more forward-deployed troops in the region than any other country. We do more two-way trade with the region than any other country. We are the number one foreign direct investor in the region. We have more diplomatic personnel in the region than any other country. And we give more humanitarian aid and more development aid in the region than any other country. We truly are a strong partner for the, the nations in the region. We'll continue to do that. But we need to do more. We need, we've realized that as the region, the Indo-Pacific region, uh, uh, increases in both population and economic weight, our efforts there have to increase along with it. We also acknowledge that we have to expand the aperture in which we conceive of the, nation, uh, conceive of the region. Uh, not just Asia Pacific, not just East Asia, but this term Indo-Pacific is significant. It acknowledges uh, the historical fact, the inextricable link between South Asia and particularly India with the rest of Asia, in particular Southeast Asia. It acknowledges the fact that we need India to become uh, uh, a, a strong partner in the rest of the region because it is committed to the same free and open principles that we want to endorse in the region and promote and protect as we move forward uh, with our partners and with our allies. Um, so again, I mentioned this was an entire USG effort, and we have an interagency process right now to identify, again, those new programs and efforts beyond what we are currently doing to embed those principles, to embed our presence and engagement in the region. And we can talk more about that, but I'll stop here because I don't want to take up all the time from, from the, the, the August panel here. And we're going to get several rounds here. That's a great uh, opener, Alex. I want to turn now to Dave Helvey, who is the Principal uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs, but has been long working on these issues of uh, strategy and strategic competition and cooperation at the Pentagon. So Dave, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Pat, and uh, thanks to you all for, for being here at the CNAS conference. Uh, you know, from a Defense Department perspective, uh, we're in full support of this overall you know, whole of government approach uh, that the Trump administration is taking to the Indo-Pacific. 
Uh, Secretary Mattis uh, uh, drafted, articulated, pushed out the, uh, the national defense strategy. It nests within the national security strategy and identifies uh, the Indo-Pacific region as the priority region, the priority theater for the Department of Defense. Uh, this in many ways reflects the reality. We have uh, five treaty allies, as Alex mentioned. Uh, we have deep interests uh, in the region that, that span, you know, you know the entire gamut of our of our relationships, uh, so it's clearly the the, the priority uh, region for the department. Uh, a lot of this is based on, uh, you know, the core principles, you know, the foundational principles that that we and many others across the region seek to uphold, and I'll speak to those in in, in detail here in a second. They include things like the freedom of navigation and, and overflight, which is a core principle for us. They include things like the peaceful resolution of disputes. They include things like support and upholding uh, you know, international norms and standards for behavior. They include things like fair and reciprocal trade. Uh, these are core principles that are, that are important to us uh, and important to many others uh, in the region. The Department of Defense plays a role in helping uh, to defend them and, and to advance them. Uh, within the context of our national defense strategy, if you look at the main lines of effort for the national security strategy, and then you look at the national defense strategy, two of the three lines of effort uh, for our defense strategy map directly to the priorities of the national security strategy that relates to the Indo-Pacific. The first uh, is we want to be able to increase uh, the lethality of the forces. This is not only a function of improving the capabilities and the capacities of U.S. forces, but also our ability to be able to interact with and be interoperable with our allies and partners in the region. And you can see this in, in terms of the, the types of platforms and capabilities that we have and we're continuing to push out uh, into the Indo-Pacific region, whether it's four deployed aircraft carriers, advanced fighter aircraft, advanced submarines. You know, the Indo-Pacific region is the priority theater and it's the place that receives uh, our, our latest and best technology as well as uh, the technologies that we allow and, and provide to our allies. Uh, in terms of strengthening uh, our alliance and partnership relationships, a lot of this is based on the interactions that we have with them and how we're working to transform these relationships to be able to allow them to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Uh, Alex mentioned uh, Secretary Mattis' travels to the region. He's been to the region you know, six times. Uh, I think that represents the commitment that, he, that he's had uh, to engaging with uh, not only our allies but new and emerging partners like Vietnam, Indonesia, India. Uh, as, as part of our approach to build a networked set of partnerships uh, that span the entire region. Uh, we're looking to, as I said, transform these uh, alliance relationships, continuing the work that we've been doing for years with the Japanese uh, to implement the, the new defense guidelines. Uh, we're obviously continuing to work with our South Korean allies to uh, improve their capabilities and capacities to work with us to maintain deterrence and defense on the Korean Peninsula against North Korean threats and challenges. Uh, we're continuing to work with our Australian ally this year. It's the, we're celebrating the first hundred years of mateship uh, to, to bring this uh, and continue working with this uh, extremely close uh, partnership that we have with the Australians uh, to take this alliance into the next hundred years uh, through things like expanding our exercises, uh, working through our force posture initiatives with the Marines rotating to Darwin or the Enhanced Aircraft uh, Cooperation um, Program at Tyndall. Uh, we're continuing to invigorate our alliances both with, uh, with Thailand and the Philippines. Uh, and we're looking to invest considerable uh, time and energy uh, to, to build up new, uh, new partners, as I mentioned before, India, Vietnam, uh, and Indonesia. And one of the things that we have done uh, is, uh, you know, over the past, uh, you know, within the past couple of weeks, uh, the beginning of June, sorry, I've spent a lot of time on the road recently. <laughs> Uh, we, the secretary announced uh, the, a, a name change uh, for, uh, to the United States Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, this is our oldest and largest uh, combatant command. Uh, and you know, when we did the transfer from uh, Admiral Harris uh, to Admiral Davidson, uh, the secretary also changed the name of that command from the Pacific Command to the Indo-Pacific Command. I think that's a, a, a symbolic step, but it also reflects, I think, a great deal uh, the realities uh, that you know, are, are there in the region, not only in terms of the connectivity between the Indian Ocean region and the Western Pacific, uh, but also the broad recognition of the role that India plays, uh, both as a partner and as a net contributor to peace and stability in the region. 
So we've got a lot of things that we're going that we're doing uh, within the Department of Defense. Uh, like I said, this remains the that is and remains the priority theater for us, uh, and that's only going to uh, increase and, and grow stronger over time. Wonderful and um, very busy, both of you. We'll dig back into India yeah. and a few other issues in a minute. But I want to turn to our third panelist, David Lee, who's the acting chief of the Strategic Affairs and Counterterrorism Unit. He's up at the USUN working for uh, Nikki Haley, and he's one of the top North Korea experts in. I wonder, uh, David, how the strategic competition uh, looks from the vantage point of somebody working out of the United Nations right now. Thank you very much, Patrick, for inviting me and to the CNS family. Uh, it's a real honor to be here to speak with Alex and, and Dave. Um, if I could maybe start off with a, a general perspective and, and provide kind of three vignettes. Um, first and foremost, most of the political, military, and economic competition, as well as cooperation, are occurring in the region, no doubt. But there is a fair amount of activities now incur uh, occurring at the UN and in other multilateral fora driven by China and to a lesser degree Russia to reshape the international system to their benefit. Uh, that is challenging the post-World War uh, to international order as well as their universal values um, that have direct impact on free and open Indo-Pacific region and beyond. Uh, as a result, we are trying to build a stronger coalition that can basically protect the system and prevent the erosion of some core principles, values, and, and interpretation of international law that are so paramount to protecting uh, the region and, and, and open democracies and, and free uh, lanes of communication. Uh, three areas that we're tracking very closely uh, first begins with North Korea, for sure. Um, we have actually been able to successfully cooperate with China over the past two, I would say, years, uh, where at first, China was uh, obviously reticent and very much fixated on its traditional perspective about North Korea and how that benefits China's broader uh, foreign policy and national security agenda in the region. But with a lot of effort uh, over the past two years, and in particular with the Trump administration being able to really focus and prioritize this issue above all else, we were able to convince China to partner with us on ratcheting the pressure on North Korea. And we've done so to a lesser degree, but still importantly with Russia as well. They've you know, come kicking and screaming, but they did ultimately join consensus on all the resolutions that we adopted in the Security Council over the past two years to create the, the most dramatic sanctions program ever imposed on North Korea. Now, we are obviously entering a new phase, and uh, we are still uh, trying to make sure that China and other partners stay with us through this process to be able to maintain pressure, and we hope that China uh, will do so uh, to ensure that we can achieve complete denuclearization. Uh, in other areas, we have had, unfortunately, less success and, and, and greater com amounts of con uh, competition, rather. Uh, the one area that I would like to highlight is that in, at the UN, in the Security Council, in the General Assembly, and even in discussions with UN agencies about development and other related programs, China and Russia have been waging a very strong and capable off, uh, uh, offensive game to change uh, the international system and international order. Uh, they have been primarily focusing on strengthening the primacy of central governments, on uh, protecting national sovereignty at all costs to the direct detriment of human rights, civil society, and the rule of law. And these, of course, from a conceptual perspective, uh, impose real costs on us, but in the real world as well, they directly translate into concrete actions that hurt our allies and our interests in the region. Uh, for example, uh, while Alice uh, will probably talk a lot more about Taiwan in far more intelligent ways, from the narrow perspective that we have in New York, they have effectively shut out Taiwan from any discussions in, at the UN or other multilateral fora. Not only have they been uh, unable to participate in the WHO, no civil society from Taiwan can participate in any UN proceedings. It's gotten to the point where even Taiwanese citizens cannot obtain a UN tour because they do not have a Chinese passport. Um, moving to Burma, we've watched the crisis grow unresolved uh, with the Rohingya peoples. And uh, unfortunately, in the Security Council, we've not been able to make forward progress necessary to start addressing that, uh, that crisis in, a, in an effective manner to be able to resolve it in a sustainable way. Um, when we look at uh, the counterterrorism related efforts that China and Russia push with regards to justifying uh, draconian security actions by central authorities for the sake of security. Um, this has had direct impact, uh, whether it's Xinjiang Uyghurs who are being shut out of civil society participation by being called terrorists, 
uh, to a variety of other actions that shut out uh, non-central government voices in multilateral fora, starting with the UN and beyond. And finally, uh, on the economic development front as well, uh, again, while uh, Alex and, and Dave will talk more, much more about the One Belt, One Road initiative, we are seeing both from a normative perspective but also from a programming perspective, active push by China to revamp the discussions at the UN and in other multilateral fora, including at multilateral development banks and UN development agencies, about the benefits of OBOR, um, as well as more normative uh, concepts that are not necessarily labeled as Belt and Road Initiative, but certainly lend a lot more credence and justification to such activities. And we have been seeing a shift from relatively neutral organizations that have promoted uh, best practices and, 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 and good ways of, of looking at economic development in an objective and neutral manner to now focusing more on supporting any injection of cash at all costs to spur on development and growth. And it has, in essence, muted the voices of many developing countries who are directly beneficiaries of it, but also somewhat held hostage by those relationships from speaking out against them and pushing back on a reshaping of international thinking about how to develop economies in an effective manner, including a market-based approach that is so critical to ensuring sustainable success. David, thank you. In the second round of questions here, I'd like to come back to <clears throat> types of competition that we're experiencing, especially uh, with China, but also with North Korea. Uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative, we heard my colleague Dan Kleiman today give a trenchant discussion of new creative strategies that can be uh, employed in the future to try to counter some of the more uh, aggressive elements of that and cooperate in others. But Alex, how do you look at the strategy that the administration is pursuing when you think about a challenge as big as the One Belt, One Road initiative coming out of China? Sure. If, if I could just re reframe kind of the, the, the question you give. You know, I think there's a temptation on the part of uh, the D.C. foreign policy community and also within the government to, to look at what the United States needs to do to you know, quote unquote, respond to OBOR. But I kind of view this differently. I really see OBOR as China's response to the longstanding free and open order that we, together with our partners, have established really globally, but in particular in the Indo-Pacific in the past 70 years. It is this market-based order, a rules-based order, a free and open order that has led to the prosperity, the regional integration, the type of connectivity that has brought, again, stability and prosperity to the Indo-Pacific that we've seen over the past few decades. And you look at OBOR, which was only announced in 2013, you know, a couple of years old, and didn't really begin to take shape and has yet to take full concrete shape. Uh, that is a response from China on how do we uh, 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 catch up to this free and open order? How do we catch up to the system uh, that has been uh, guarded by and defended by the United States over the past few decades? So in, in my thinking, we don't really need to respond to OBOR. What we need to do is ensure and create the incentives and empower our partners in the region to say that if China wants to play in the, in the uh, arena of, of regional integration, if it wants to play in the arena of infrastructure and connectivity, it has to play by the high standards, the best value standards that will ensure broad prosperity and preserve the sovereignty uh, of the nations of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so we are not, meaning the US government, it's not terribly concerned about where the financing comes from or from what country it comes from. We're much more concerned about how the financing is structured so that these can be paid back in a sustainable manner by partners and recipient nations and provincial governments that receive these loans from, from China. And we're concerned about how the projects are conceived and implemented. We want these projects, whatever they happen to be, to be economically feasible, connected to the people and the local communities and the economies and the environments of the recipient nations uh, so that they are, uh, they do bring and, and lift up the economies and not weigh them down. And there are large questions about whether you know, uh, the projects under OBOR, not all of them, but a, a number of them, meet these standards, meet the proven strategies we know that can actually bring prosperity and bolster stability. That's a good point. I want to turn to Dave Helby and have him uh, maybe respond to really what we've heard about twin challenges emerging from China short term in terms of gray zone operations, the South China Sea in particular, of course, China just disinvited from the RIMPAC exercise this year, but the long-term challenge that Bob Burke also alluded to earlier in a great presentation, looking at so-called offset strategy of China on technology and trying to leap ahead with technology. How does, how does the Defense Department try to grapple with both this immediate gray zone challenge that we're experiencing in the Pacific, as well as try to continue to keep ahead 
with long-term technology? Uh, well, thanks for that, uh, that question, Pat. Unfortunately, I, had, I got to miss uh, Bob Work's uh, presentation earlier today, but uh, let me take the, the second part first, and then I can address the South China Sea more specifically second. Yeah, as I mentioned in my uh, response to the first question, if you look at how the national defense strategy is structured, it really is a strategy that's designed to enable the Department of Defense to make the right types of investments uh, that will position us to be able to not only compete but prevail in, in a long-term competition. Uh, we're looking to make sure that we're investing in the right types of technologies uh, to ensure that our soldier sailors, airmen, marine, coast guardsmen, you know, that have the, the, the best technology and equipment that, that, that's available that allow us to be able to perform our missions uh, to, to defend and advance our interests and those of our allies and our partners. Uh, and you know, our, our, our defense budgets uh, in future years obviously will be reflecting what those investments will be. I'm not a budgeteer and I'm not gonna talk about a future budget, uh, but part of it is how we invest in those technologies to ensure that we have uh, the best capabilities. Related and a corollary to that uh, is how we, how we can uh, protect and, and defend those technologies. And that's something that we have to do a better job of, and that's ensuring that we have the right type of technology security practices to ensure that the investments that we make uh, are, are, are protected and that they don't uh, fall in the hands of others like China, which have pretty, have, has a pretty active program uh, to achieve their leap ahead by, by shortcutting uh, and either stealing technology or in some cases even acquiring it. Uh, legally, so we have to look at ways to improve our export control and our the ways that we can kind of review process uh, investments and other types of acquisitions, improve our cyber defenses and cybersecurity uh, to be able to ensure that the technology that we're investing in and that we're sharing with our partners uh, is is protected. I think a third element of it, and this is uh, one of the areas where the United States has and will retain a, a true comparative advantage, is how we develop. Uh, the network and the interoperability with our allies and with our partners. Uh, to the extent that we can work together, we can operate together, we can perform you know, different types of missions and operations seamlessly in concert uh, with our allies and partners represents one of the best ways that I think we can maintain you know, our strategic advantage. And I can offer just one example of some of the things that we're doing today uh, that we didn't do just, uh, just a few years ago. Uh, working with our Japanese allies, we're doing what they call mutual asset protection, where the Japanese are able to provide, for the first time, defense uh, of the uh, assets and capabilities, ships, aircraft, whatever, uh, that we have operating in the region uh, with the Japanese. Uh, that's something that is new, that's something that's different, and that's something that provides a tremendous uh, force multiplier uh, from our perspective. <coughs> so, I mean, that's part of how we do it. I mean, we'll... we'll Continuing to invest in the types of technologies that, that uh, Bob Work started uh, when he was here uh, as, the, as, the, as the deputy, uh, including some time as deputy uh, early last year, looking at the next generation types of technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, advanced materials, the types of connective enablers that, that allow us to, to be able to, to operate in the new types of domains uh, that we and all nations are gonna be confronting both today and tomorrow. With respect to your question on the South China Sea, uh, you know, this, is a, this is a tough issue because, as you said, it's gray zone and it's clear that it appears that uh, some parties, namely China, uh, are seeking to, to compete below the level of what we would call armed conflict. They're looking to press their advantage in, in a way that doesn't trigger the reaction of others uh, to, to provide the type of you know, direct or, or kinetic, in, in DOD speak, uh, pushback. And that does create some challenges for the countries in the region. It creates some challenges uh, for us. Um, in terms of how we respond to it, I think we could you know, break it down into four, you know, four areas. I think the first is that we want to be able to, to maintain regular presence and, and, and you know, conduct freedom of navigation operations. Uh, since uh, January 2017, we've conducted eight uh, freedom of navigation operations uh, in the Spratly and Parasol Islands in the South China Sea. Again, reinforcing and underscoring uh, the, the words that we've said for years about flying, sailing, and operating where international law allows. Maintaining those, uh, those high sea freedoms uh, is absolutely critical. We also have other countries that are also maintaining their presence and sending ships, assets, and vessels out there, whether it's France, the United Kingdom, Australia, Japan, others. 
uh, that's, that's a big part of helping to maintain that presence. This isn't something that we do alone. Um, uh, it's something that we're doing in concert with others. The second is to be able to maintain uh, investment in our own uh, capabilities, uh, which is all in part about what I talked about in the first response to the question, ensuring that we have lethal ready forces uh, in the region. The third is to be able to improve the capacity uh, of, uh, of our partners uh, around the region, including uh, those states that are also claimants to the South China Sea, to allow them to be able to uh, you know, protect and preserve uh, their own maritime interests, as well as to be able to cooperate with the countries to the left and right of them, and with us and others in the international community. And there, we're continuing to move forward with the Maritime Security Initiative, which was something that was started in 2016, and we're also looking at ways to potentially expand that authority uh, to bring in countries from the Indian Ocean region and extend the term of the funds. Uh, that's a critically important uh, uh, you know, part of our response to the gray zone, is working with our partners to improve their capacity and their knowledge of what's going on. Uh, and I think the last part uh, is, is how we deal with China. Um, you know, how we ensure that we're maintaining the type of relationship with China uh, that manages the competition uh, in, in a way that uh, hopefully and ultimately redounds to, to, to our benefit. Uh, part of that is ensuring that we maintain stable and open channels of communication with our Chinese counterparts. Part of it is ensuring that we're, we're introducing and exercising the right types of risk reduction mechanisms, hotlines, confidence building measures, these types of things, so that when we're operating in close proximity to, or, to each other or they're operating in close proximity to other navies or other nations, that they're done in a safe and predictable way or if there is some type of incident or accident that doesn't spiral into the type of crisis. And you'll see some of the things that we're doing, whether it's you know, the freedom of navigation or the, the capacity building or the capabilities that we're putting out in the region or our actions that we're doing with China. Uh, all that is kind of part of how we're competing and managing in this space. Other things that we're doing, like the disinvitation that Secretary Mattis announced in, in, uh, in Singapore, uh, of China's participation in RIMPAC is actually a relatively small thing. Um, you know, RIMPAC is the largest naval exercise. It brings countries, navies together to be able to work in cooperation with each other in upholding the types of international norms and standards that we all share. And to the extent that China's behavior, whether it's militarization or other types of pressure in the South China Sea is inconsistent with that, then they don't have a place for, they don't have a place in that exercise. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's just part of the response that we have to that. The sand is running down in the hourglass. And I want to turn to Abigail Grace, who's one of our newest research associates, just joined us from the NSC staff working for Matt Pottinger to maybe say a few words. And if there's time for a question, we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. So first, I want to thank all of our panelists for taking time to join us today. The most valuable asset that our senior leaders in the US government have is their time. So the fact that they're here with us today uh, means a lot. So my question is for uh, Das Alex Wong. Um, we just heard Pete Asdi Helvey talk a lot about the benefits of interoperability and allied support to one another's capabilities. Earlier this morning, Dr. Eli Ratner talked a lot about how the economic side and security side of China policy uh, perhaps could use with some more synergy. And I didn't know what uh, lessons learned from allied uh, interoperability you could take from the Department of Defense and apply to the economic response to One Belt, One Road. Yeah, so I, I think we can take a lot of lessons in, in that, uh, you know, doing things together and uh, uh, supporting the same values is better than doing it alone. Uh, and we're, we're putting uh, our actions behind that, that principle, uh, particularly on infrastructure, particularly on connectivity. Uh, we have a number of cooperative agreements well, with, with partner nations in the Indo-Pacific to um, foster infrastructure that meets the high standards, best value standards that we promote. So a, a uh, partnership between OPIC uh, as well as Japan's uh, corollary JBIC, a trilateral infrastructure initiative we have with India and Japan, uh, a, a nascent uh, energy uh, secure, I'm sorry, energy infrastructure partnership with Japan. Uh, and I'm, you know, always talk about exploring other partnerships, whether it's with the ROK or whether it's, it's with Australia, where we can identify those um, third country recipient nations that would benefit from the, the synergistic uh, facilitation of infrastructure in their countries from, from our partners. And doing that together, A, brings our, our various core competencies in this area to bear, whether it's uh, you know, mundane, not mundane, but technical capabilities like tunneling or uh, the ability to do policy infrastructure, what policies you need to facilitate the type of infrastructure and, and putting those together. But simply the message of having our nations work together 
to again promote the type of infrastructure that drives regional integration in a positive fashion. That, that, that uh, amplifies our messaging on this. All right, great. And with that, let's turn to the audience and take some questions. Please raise your hand. Hi, um, Chia Chang from United Day News Taiwan. Um, since it's about Indo-Pacific strategy, and none of you mentioned Taiwan, if um, Alex and David could explain the the role of Taiwan in this strategy, thank you. We, we certainly want a word on uh, uh, Taiwan. Please add a word on India as well, and what we're doing on the Indo-Pacific. We would have asked that as a third round of questions, but we we're caught short. But just very brief answers here, please. Do you want to start? On? I can add. Sure. Well, uh, Taiwan, as uh, everybody here knows, is a is a is a critically important partner uh, of the United States. Our policies uh, you know, are grounded in the Taiwan Relations Act and the Six Assurances. We continue to make available to Taiwan defense articles and services necessary to maintain Taiwan's uh, self-defense. You know, if I could uh, encapsulate what I kind of see as Taiwan's role in the Indo-Pacific strategy, it would be in phrase of ensuring that Taiwan is able to maintain uh, the, the right types of investments in its own defense capabilities to ensure that uh, it's able to maintain the right type of deterrence and balance across the Taiwan Strait, enabling Taiwan to be able to interact with the mainland uh, and engage in whatever discussions both sides would want to have uh, that would, um, you know, consistent with yeah, our over, overall approach towards uh, the cross-strait relationship. So I mean, I think that that role I think is uh, is critically important from the Department of Defense perspective. So you know, when when folks, particularly in the USG, talk about Taiwan, they always uh, and they have to reference the Taiwan Relations Act, the Joint Communiques, are the U.S. One China policy. But behind those talismanic phrases, what is the basis of our relationship with Taiwan? Is shared values, a commitment to democracy, a commitment to market economics, and a commitment to making positive contributions to the international system. So in that respect, Taiwan plays a very strong and important role in the Indo-Pacific because it is the embodiment of the types of reforms and types of values that we want to promote throughout the Indo-Pacific and truly throughout, throughout the world. That's why we have that strong relationship. And I should mention, we just uh, opened up a new uh, uh, AIT facility in Taipei. And you know, it, it is a demonstration when you pour concrete of the strength and the enduring uh, uh, nature of a relationship. But particularly, and if you look at the architecture of what we built in, in, in Taipei, the biggest piece and the most impressive piece with most natural light in the center of that facility is the consular facility. And that's important in my mind because it shows that the, the basis of the relationship is not up here with, with USG officials or, 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 or diplomatic statements. It is uh, the people-to-people -people ties that we have with, with Taiwan and, again, the shared values. Alex, some in the region are accusing the Trump administration of trying to revise the One China policy. Did you want to just briefly address that? Uh, so uh, I will say the One China policy has been reaffirmed, our One China policy has been reaffirmed by, by this administration. And uh, you can see the commitment that the administration has made to the One China policy uh, by the, uh, the arms sales and the arms sales package they, they made and other, other moves like the AIT building. But I will say if there are attempts to revise the, the understanding across the strait, it is not coming from the United States. It is the d disturbance in the status quo is coming again from some of the actions that, that David has highlighted of squeezing uh, the international space for Taiwan to make the contributions that really benefit the international community on uh, humanitarian uh, assistance, uh, taking part in uh, uh, the World Health Assembly and other actions uh, like that coming from Beijing. So the stability of the region is dependent on the status quo across the strait. So the, the U.S. government is very concerned about any attempts to disturb that status quo. Abby, how are we doing for time? I think we have time for one more question. Let's see if we can last more. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey. I'm an intel analyst and a former diplomat. Um, I had an opportunity to present on Chinese intelligence assets in the South China Sea at the Pentagon. And one thing that met with uh, absolute uh, agreement was that there will be another incident, something like the uh, drone capture about a year and a half ago. And everybody knows there's going to be another incident. And following on that, the one thing that meant with universal befuddlement was what are the rules of engagement in the South China Sea? Right now, it was the opinion of all these Navy captains 
that they were dealing with rules of engagement that would be relevant to Hainan Island as well. And that just doesn't seem right to me. It seems like you might have a bit more latitude in captured territories and stolen reefs and so forth. Is that something uh, y'all agree with, that the rules of engagement are exactly the same as integral Chinese territory? And is that something the think tanks could explore to present additional rules of engagement for this much murkier situation? And as David Helvey maybe tries to give a brief response to that question, try to think through Coast Guards and the civilian interaction, commercial shipping out there. I know that's, Japan gives a lot of thought to that with respect to the Senkaku Islands, the role of the Coast Guard, the handoff to potentially the Maritime Self-Defense Force. How, are, how is the U.S. thinking about potential interaction between gray holes and white holes and uh, many actors out there on the, on the high seas? Uh, yeah, I think... Yeah, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question because rules of engagement are not generally something that we that we you know talk about a whole lot of. Um, yeah, I think the the first thing that I would just come back and say, look, we don't have a position on the sovereignty, uh, but we do have a position on on making sure that those waters and those water spaces uh, remain open, uh, and that you know we don't see uh, any elements of this dispute resolved uh, through coercion or certainly by non-peaceful means. Um, you know, our, our vessels will continue to defend themselves. They have inherent right of self-defense, and I'm not sure, um, you know, if I need to get a little bit beyond that. Um, in terms of, in terms of the, the gray holes versus white holes, this is a complicated issue, and I don't know if there's a very clear, you know, straight answer to, to, to give, uh, because a lot of this has to do with the situation and how it evolves, but it's certainly an area that uh, we've got perhaps some more work to do to, to be able to be clear on how we, how we deal with that. Um, you know, certainly if you have a, a, you know, uh, you know, something that's like a Coast Guard, but it's operating in a way that's aggressive against a naval vessel or other ships, you know, that's something that we've got to figure out how to deal with. You know, I think you know, one of the things that we're, uh, we're learning a lot more about, thanks to the experts up at the China Maritime Studies Institute up in Newport, is uh, China's maritime militia. Uh, and the role that it plays, and uh, command and control relationships that it plays, and, and how we deal and confront uh, you know, aggressive uh, or disruptive uh, behavior from that. Uh, so that's something that we've got, uh, we've, got some, we've got some work to do to develop. But uh, just make no mistake, our, our, our naval, naval vessels, officers, aircraft, uh, are able to defend themselves if they're challenged. So. And finally, let me just get one sentence from David Lee. He's come all the way down from the United Nations. And we heard over lunchtime from former South Korean National Security Advisor Chun um, that if uh, we wanted to go back to maximum pressure, after the Singapore summit, that could be impossible. If you think about it from the United Nations perspective, what it took to get the cooperation going to the summit and getting to diplomacy with North Korea, how do you, in one sentence, do you think it's impossible or do you think it's going to be possible to uh, either relieve the pressure by peeling off sanctions if there's cooperation with North Korea, or imposing even maximum pressure again if there's a faltering of this agreement? I'm trying to figure out how to do it in one sentence. Uh, <laughs> I would say that um, it is extremely difficult but not impossible uh, and will require significant trade-offs, in particular with relations uh, you know, with, US, uh, with, with uh, China. I want to, this has been a great panel. I'm sorry we don't have more time. There's so much more to discuss. We didn't even get to talk about India, and we, we had decided ahead of time we were going to definitely talk about India. Um, that's how big this region is. That's how important it is. About ASEAN, I want to mention that. ASEAN, ASEAN and Southeast Central. Asia. Yeah. Um, the, these officials are the ones implementing policy, and they are doing it tirelessly, and they're backed by a lot of others. Um, and it's just incredible how much activity is going on behind the scenes. So I'm impressed, as somebody who runs an Asia program, just watching you do this work breathlessly, taking time out to spend uh, on this. So please join me in thanking this panel. Montaigne, back to the stage for his final remarks. All right, thank you, Patrick. Well, with that uh, last and important panel on the future, the present and the future of the Indo-Pacific region, it is time to bring the 12th 
annual CNAS uh, National Security Conference to a close. Um, I wanted to thank um, all of the speakers who joined us today, um, all of our panelists and guests, um, including those from the Trump administration, from the military, from Capitol Hill, and from beyond, um, without whom um, we would not have been able to put on what I hope was um, an effort to uh, address seriously the kinds of national security challenges facing the United States at this moment in our history. Um, and of course, the success of our conference is always owed in large measure to uh, those who uh, participate in the audience, the questions that you ask, the engagement that you have. So thank you for that, and thank you for coming out. Before we close, just briefly, I'd like to thank uh, specifically a few um, who have made uh, today possible. First, our media partner, The Washington Post, our sponsors for their generous support and commitment. And I'll take a moment now uh, to read the names of our gold level uh, sponsors this year. It's 21st Century Fox, Airbus Group, Bank of America, Boeing, Boston Consulting Group, Chevron, Cisco, General Atomics, Huntington Ingalls Industries, Leonardo DRS, Northrop Grumman, Prudential, and Raytheon. So thank you to them and to all of our sponsors uh, for supporting this conference, for making it possible, and for all of the work that we do. Um, last but not least, uh, let me thank uh, the wonderful uh, and amazing CNA staff, uh, some of whom you saw on the stage, many of whom uh, you probably didn't even see because they were behind the scenes making all of this stuff uh, successful. Um, and special appreciation goes to Jasmine Butler, Aline Bryant, Lawrence Shulman, and Sean Turner. And now uh, is time for what is often the most eagerly anticipated event of all in our conference, which of course is a closing reception. Uh, so why don't we adjourn ourselves and right outside these doors we can continue our discussions in a more informal setting. Thank you very much.